This video was made possible by Skillshare, home to over 26,000 classes that'll teach you just about anything. This is the Boeing 747, more than twice the size of any airliner before it, the jumbo jet revolutionized air travel. And it impressed more than just the flying public. Because as crazy as it sounds, in 1973, the US Air Force considered turning airliners into airborne aircraft carriers. These once classified documents detail how a 747 could be used to launch and recover fighter jets in midair and how by the 1980s, airborne aircraft carriers stationed around the world would bring air power to anywhere in just hours. In 1968, Boeing unveiled the 747, two and a half times the size of any jetliner before it. The so-called jumbo jet transformed the way we fly. And at least part of this plane's existence is thanks to this man, Juan Tripp, the president of Pan American Airways and a bit of a visionary. Because Tripp foresaw how a plane this big could help decongest overcrowded airports and bring down the cost of flying opening up air travel to the middle class. And when Tripp's airline put in the first order for 747s, he boasted how the plane would become a great weapon for peace because it would connect the world and bring people together. But it turns out the Air Force had other ideas. The 747, along with the newly introduced Lockheed C-5, were a new kind of aircraft. With their enormous size, power, and range, these planes opened up some intriguing possibilities. The Navy's seaborne carrier force could already move air power across oceans, but an airborne equivalent would have the ability to reach deep inland areas and be in any part of the world in just hours. And the idea for an airborne carrier force wasn't totally out of left field, because the Navy once had airborne aircraft carriers two of them. When launched in the early 1930s, the airships USS Akron and USS Macon were the size of battleships. Crewed by 60 men and protected by eight machine guns, the enormous airships were just five meters short of being the largest objects to ever take to the skies. But these were no ordinary airships. Designed as long-range scouts for the US Navy, each had an internal hangar housing up to five planes called parasite fighters which extended the airship's scouting range and could even help defend it. A trapeze system below the carrier would deploy and recover the fighters while in flight. The problem was, while the parasite fighters worked, the massive airships didn't. Both were destroyed in weather-related accidents less than three years after their introduction, and that helped put an end to airships. But not the idea of flying aircraft carriers, because a decade and a half later, the Air Force was again experimenting with the concept. For the first time ever, intercontinental bombers could fly halfway around the world, but their fighter escorts couldn't. One promising solution was to have the bombers carry their escorts along for the ride. But sticking a full-sized fighter jet underneath a bomber would limit its range due to extra drag. So the new fighter escort would have to be small enough to fit entirely inside the bomb bay. And so this is what they came up with, the world's tiniest fighter jet. The Air Force planned to have B-36 bombers carry anywhere from one to four of these small jets, depending on the mission. This time, the carrier worked, but the fighter jets didn't. The tiny egg-shaped jets were so sensitive to turbulence while docking Test pilots only managed to do it three times. It proved far too dangerous. But the efforts continued into the 1950s, including experimenting with a way to dock full-sized fighters to bombers by linking their wingtips. The idea was not only to extend the range of the fighter jets, but the bombers as well, by effectively giving them large glider-like wings. But docking using this system proved even more difficult and dangerous. Really, the only successful implementation of the idea was to carry a single reconnaissance or nuclear strike fighter, half tucked under a B-36, and just accept the extra drag. 
And by the mid-1950s, it was clear that newly perfected aerial refueling was a far safer and more sensible way to extend aircraft range. But the Air Force took yet another look in 1973, because the landscape had changed entirely. The newly introduced 747 and C-5 were large and powerful enough to not only deploy and recover fighter escorts mid-air, but also refuel and rearm them in mid-flight. So the Air Force commissioned Boeing to study the concept. And not surprisingly, Boeing focused on using a 747, citing superior range and cruising speed. And it would have worked something like this. Housed inside a 747's pressurized hold would be 10 unique fighter jets called microfighters. With each fighter jet suspended from an overhead conveyor system, they could be positioned over one of two launch bays. To launch a fighter, a set of arms would lower it into a bay, which would then be sealed and depressurized. The jet would then be lowered, and away it would go. By Boeing's estimates, it could take as little as 80 seconds to deploy two microfighters. To recover a fighter, it would first dock with a refueling boom. And if it needed rearming, the jet would be brought back inside. The carrier crew could turn around a microfighter for a new mission in as little as 10 minutes. Also crammed into the 747 would be fuel, armament, and spare parts, and a crew of 44. 12 carrier crew, 14 squadron pilots, and another 18 mission specialists. On top of that, the 747 would also be fitted with sleeping quarters and a crew lounge. That seems like a lot to jam inside one 747. But the viability of the concept hinged not so much on the carrier, but the fighters, which would have to be miniaturized to fit inside a carrier aircraft. With a wingspan just over 5 meters and about one-third the weight of a conventional fighter, the microfighters would be armed with a pair of 20mm cannons and could be fitted with either air-to-air missiles or bombs. Boeing was confident these little guys could stand toe-to-toe with something like a MiG-21. Airborne carriers could operate out of anywhere with a big enough airfield and function as a battle group with supporting aerial refuelers and radar pickets giving the Air Force the ability to be anywhere in the world within hours, when a typical seaborne carrier force would need days or weeks. Of course, 747 aircraft carriers were never built. You'd need a lot more than a 60-page study to get something like this to work. And while Boeing's engineers were confident that with further development, airborne aircraft carriers could enter service by the 1980s, the Air Force didn't pursue the idea. With air combat evolving so dramatically throughout the 1960s and 70s, developing a 747 carrier with special microfighters would likely prove to be a dead end, because lightweight microfighters might have made sense in the 1970s, but by the late 1980s, they would have been hopelessly outclassed against fourth-generation fighters. But the Air Force isn't done with the concept. Over the next few years, the Department of Defense will unveil a new carrier system. But this time, they'll deploy unmanned drones. Which, in comparison, doesn't quite stir the imagination. (music) 3D modeling is a great way to communicate ideas. But sometimes, a simple graphic can be just as effective. Whether you're trying to explain something, market your idea, or just have fun. And everything you need to know from the basics of drawing to mastering graphic software is all at Skillshare, an online community for creators, freelancers, or anyone who just wants to develop new skills. A foundational tool for your creative toolbox is vector drawing software. I use Adobe Illustrator, which is the basis for all my still and motion graphics. A class that caught my eye was Dylan Mirwinski's introduction to using the Shape Builder tool. In just under half an hour, you'll have all you need to create goofy characters, or anything else you want. Quick, easy, and fun, it's just another great Skillshare course. With over 26,000 classes at your fingertips, covering just about anything, Skillshare is an incredible resource to have, and a premium subscription to Skillshare is less than $10 a month. 
But if you're one of the first 500 people to sign up using the link in the description below, you get two months for absolutely free.